Our next presenters are contributors to the 2022 Fashion Reset Report, part of the Sustainable Fashion Toolkit from Fashion Takes Action. They're now continuing this research and are here to share it with us. Please join me in welcoming Julia Ch Chinakeva. I'm so sorry if I've I've actually taken apart your last name. Um, I should know this, sorry. Uh, principal at Bazaar Ventures Fund and Rahul Verma, uh, digital fashion consultant at No Form. And if you have any questions for everybody, please put them into the chat. Lovely to see you. So Hello. lovely to see you. Thank you. Hello. Do you, uh, does everyone see my screen? Uh, do we? Are we, I guess, all set? I guess Absolutely. So. Go for it. Perfect. Okay. Well, then I'll let you, I'll let you pick this one up. Yes. All right. Let's do this. Uh, so thank you for having us. Uh, we are very happy to be here today. Um, this is my colleague, Julia. Um, I think she, she's been introduced already, but I do want to mention that in past, she worked as management consultant with KPMG and Accenture. So, so that's a big deal. And I do have fashion design background. Um, so I think, uh, you know, Julia's background with in business and mind with fashion, we, we make a very good team. Um, we started working and, and researching together in 2021 when we got introduced by uh, a company in, in Paris. Uh, we both were working for uh, from distance. And, uh, and then in collaboration with two other authors, we published the fashion reset report um, on, on the interline. Uh, Julia, could you go to the next and the next? Yes, okay. Um, and I'm gonna put the link for this in the chat uh, shortly. The report focused on how technology is um, encouraging sustainable endeavors in, in the industry from the point of view of materials, practices, uh, processes, as well as business models. And in business model, we focused on on-demand manufacturing. So Fashion Reset 2.0 is uh, the continuation of, of this research. Uh, where we are only focusing on on-demand and uh, testing our hypothesis through uh, qualitative and uh, quantitative data. It's, I, I, I must mention that it's work in progress, so uh, we're not done yet. I think we worked on it for maybe one and a half to two months for now. Uh, we want to continue doing this and we, would, um, we plan to publish uh, it by the end of this year. Now, uh, sustainability is a very complex topic and um, there are many arguments, but there was one quote that really stuck with us during the research that we found out. And it is, yeah, yeah the next one. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. If we really want to reduce the carbon we consume, why don't we start with the 20% of inventory we are disposing every year? And with, uh, with this, very powerful statement uh, uh, and the question and some of the critical question we chatted with uh, 10 plus uh, stakeholders um, businesses um, and and we asked these these very important questions to them of course uh, we spoke with tech providers these are the these are the people who are really um, uh, the they are the one who are facilitating this whole process and connecting the, the brands and the customers and their factories together so very important role uh, they are playing. And of course, uh, brands, uh, made to order brands, as well as um, you know some global brands we spoke to. Uh, we didn't have the permission to use their logos. So yeah, in case you're wondering. Um, all right. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about uh, what does on-demand really mean and kind of break it down so you know, everybody you know, in our audience is on the same page. And uh, I want to say that, you know, there are a lot of similar sounding words, which can be a bit confusing sometimes. So um, that's that. But regardless, uh, the what remains common is that the demand always comes first in the sense that you order first and then the product is manufactured later. And for, and for clarity, we, we analyzed all these different on-demand practices and, um, and, and, and uh, kind of like, you know, presented them here on a scale of degree of complexity uh, that goes into it, uh, time to 
you know, time it takes to complete them, as well as the room um, or, or need for automation from the scalability point of view. So on the very top is Bespoke, which is where the product is specifically made for uh, you as for your specifications and, and taste. Made to measure is where there's some standardization, but deep customization is uh, possible. Made to order with customization means that you can make some changes. You can pick maybe a fabric that you like, the color that you like, and certain details that you like. But um, the customization is not very deep. It's, it's subtle. And then made to order as in pre-order is when you um, pretty much you know order ahead of time. And then once they have enough order, there is a small batch manufacturing. And then when it's ready, it is shipped to you. So, that's what we think is most scalable at the moment because of the fact that it's at the bottom of this sort of you know uh, analysis that we that we did. Um, we now now even though all of these are kind of you know different uh, at, in these three parameters, what remains common in all these different approaches is that the goal uh, is the same, which is to not overshoot the demand, you know, like, like understand the demand first and then supply. And if you think about it fundamentally, that's how clothes were always made before, ready to wear before industrialization. But obviously we can't do that now uh, in, in today's economic circumstances, but um, that's where the, the technology is helping. It is, a, it is an enabler and Julia will talk more about that. Um, let's uh, go to the next one, Julia. Mm -hmm. So, is it is it worth the hassle? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we know already that you know the current supply chains uh, in the industry can be very unreliable uh, and opaque. Uh, in reality, uh, I guess it's very not not so uncommon that there is no direct communication between the brands and the factories. MOQs can be high, especially for small small brands. Uh, wasted excess inventory. This this number can be up to thirty percent, as as we mentioned earlier, and um, the risk that may come from increasingly uh, new laws and bills surrounding ethics and sustainability, as well as the pressure from the industry of really taking sustainability seriously. Um, I think benefits are very clear. You know, the first one I think is is explains itself. The, the, because of the nature of on-demand, there is no inventory. At least uh, there's no inventory of uh, finished products. Um, and also because these are custom products, uh, the, the, the return rate is not very high. Um, supply chain simplification, again, because of the nature of on-demand, you're working very closely with your factories, so that's there. Digital readiness, uh, one of the prerequisites for adopting on-demand is digitalization. So in a way, I mean, I mean, not really prerequisite, but it will definitely help if you have at least taken the very first step to a digitalization and your, your, your processes have some element of that already. And there are obvious environmental benefits as I think, uh, as I mentioned. So these are some, uh, some benefits. Uh, now Julia can, can talk more about uh, the technical technical side of it. Sure. Thanks, Raul. Yeah. So um, now we know what um, on-demand is, what it does, what it targets. So essentially, as Raul mentioned, uh, that, that the aspect that fascinates us the most is potential, this potential elimination of the 20 to 30 percent that um, uh, brands oftentimes kind of have to over order. And uh, um, let's dive into uh, how it could be done. Um, as mentioned by um, Charlotte from Lectra, successful on-demand brands are tech companies first and fashion second. Um, technology is behind every single building block um, that um, allows to create the seamless workflow and interoperability between all the um, all the major uh, building blocks of on-demand. Um, essentially, a brand would need five major. Uh, five major blocks uh, with software or technology behind them. Obviously a digitized design, uh, so digitized, uh, digitized patterns, uh, digitized tech bag for every product configuration um, in their collection. Um, and we noticed after speaking with several brands and tech providers that usually uh, digitization could take um, on average three months um, if it's done from scratch. 
Um, so it's not as lengthy or potentially as complex as some uh, might think it is very doable and uh, it has been done multiple times before. Um, then obviously there's this uh, huge building block around um, um, customer experience and um, this, I guess, a new, a more enhanced um, or at least a very different um, type of product interaction. And that would require enhancements on the front end. It would uh, require establishing um, this new enhanced um, interaction with the product. It could be uh, 2D or oftentimes it's 3D. Um, Obviously, uh, there has to be integration with um, all the other tools that, um, um, that the brand is utilizing um, either in-house um, or maybe a third party so that every single configuration that um, a final customer is inputting into um, into well on the on the soft uh, on the website so that everything is smoothly connected and could be further on passed on to the factory. Another a highly important um, aspect, another important building block is the size and fit. Um, it is important to have um, an understandable and um, easy user interface so that the customer could correctly communicate the size that they want and the fit that they want. And that is the key behind the low returns. And yet again, um, there are a lot of third uh, party providers of this technology, and it has been done multiple times before. Of course, there has to be an integration with the order processing and pattern making and all of that that we already discussed in the uh, digitized design uh, building block. Um, finally, one of the most uh, important building blocks, um, and that would be order processing and factor, um, factories connectivity. Um, the software behind us is uh, the software that allows this um, uh, the processing of the order and uh, the smooth um, transition uh, from uh, the, the smooth uh, communication from when the order is placed all the way to the factory. Um, I guess imagine if you are shopping for a dress, uh, once you click um, that you're ordering it, the order with all the necessary um, characteristics goes right into the factory and it kickstarts uh, the manufacturing of the dress for you. Um, I would quickly go through the process of how it could be done. Um, usually uh, the garment that is least I guess risky is selected um, at the depth of uh, customization is decided within the brand. Um, you would sit down most um, often with a third party tech provider and understand the tech requirements. Um, uh, if it was not done before, the vendor would be selected um, or um, uh, you would find someone with the right capabilities to build it in-house. Um, finally, depending on how sophisticated you want the front end to be, uh, you would probably also um, engage a third party for um, uh, the well in-house solution and uh, rolling out the uh, operations finally and um, after there has been enough time um, to test it, uh, the solution would be improved and scaled. Um, this is the slide that um, we took time, took some time to together. There's not um, a lot of data on how much it actually costs, what is the payback period, um, what is the production time uh, for the on-demand manufacturing. And as you can see, even um, at the starting point of about 5,000, it is possible to already kickstart the on-demand manufacturing um, and selling of the simplest, less re least riskiest um, with the item with the least risk. Um, and um, that would essentially uh, cost uh, an average about 5,000, which is not such a, um, a high uh, price or sticker shock. Um, the payback could be anywhere from six months to um, even two years um, based on our conversations, which is yet again, not as, um, not as scary. Uh, production on demand, surprisingly, similarly, is not as lengthy. Uh, on average, it could take the turnaround could be within two weeks, which is not that different from the ready to wear model that we see uh, now. And returns are um, similarly um, very, um, they're much lower than the usual 20 to 30 percent that we can see in the industry. Returns are, slight, uh, are um, tremendously reduced to, on average, about seven to 10 percent. I would probably jump uh, towards the um, uh, end of the presentation. Um, somehow we probably got very excited in the um, in the beginning, but I would love to um, highlight the spotlight of what we found. One of probably the most interesting um, innovation um, that we've discovered so far. Um, we were lucky to uh, see the microfactory uh, launched by Unspun, and. Uh, 
we became fascinated with uh, the the innovation of the process itself that um absolutely that um, skips several steps um, within the manufacturing and it goes pretty much from design to 3d weaving mm, and it makes so many um post usage um experiences i guess uh absolutely different and much easier um, as you can see on the rotating um the rotating figure over here um this is how pretty much uh, a pair of pants would be made in seconds um i guess imagine that something um the fabric is uh, manufactured not flat but essentially it becomes a tube that is later stitched together and the recycling part uh, also becomes much easier because the thread is essentially pulled out and becomes um, a thread that could be easily um, woven into a new garment um, or uh, potentially discarded. Mm. We would love to finish the presentation with answering the initial question. Um, so if we really want to reduce the carbon we consume, why don't we start uh, with the 20% of inventory that we're disposing of every year? Speaking to different brands and tech providers, we clearly see, and uh, that makes us so happy that On Demand is steadily evolving to take its rightful place, its rightful niche within the seven hours of retail. And um, it would be up to brands to um, find that sweet spot and understand how it would um, fit into their existing business model. Um, Rahul, I would uh, let you um, finish this presentation off. Um, Julia, I think I think we do have some time. So in case you want to go back to the, the slides, which we skipped. Oh, great. Uh, did I uh, mess up the time? Amazing. OK, then uh, I am very, I'm very happy to go to uh, these yes, two guys over here. Mm -hmm. So um, upon sitting down and um, probably uh, going through 100 pages um, worth of interviews, um, we found three major groups of signals um, that we found very fascinating. Um, first group would be around the um, attitudes. Um, we uh, we uh, understood that uh, there is a potential in the right messaging, messaging to the consumer around uh, the concept of on-demand. We noticed that, uh, message, that the message around on-demand that is delivered right uh, could result in that willingness to pay more and wait a little bit longer for, um, for the product. Um, if consumer sees and understands and believes in the product journey that was behind uh, the product and uh, can shows how the product was made. Um, and uh, that would be the quote from uh, Nabled for Amanda, um, which means that there have been multiple uh, use cases behind it. Um, finally, um, this delivered value um, uh, already formed um, expectations. The, it formed expectations around that it is okay to wait. And um, waiting means quality, waiting means um, uniqueness. And an interesting fact that we heard is that um, once um, a customer orders something on demand and eventually the item comes faster, it, not necess it doesn't necessarily mean better for the customer. Uh, it somehow um, messes, somehow plays with that feeling that, um, that the um, item is no longer, I guess, as unique or, or that special, like not enough hands touch the product. And we found very, this very interesting. Um, another um, area here is that um, the mindset of the industry for the change, um, the tech providers find that mindset of the industry to change is very, um, one of the hardest challenges over, um, over their, in, in their journey. Um, they oftentimes would hear that change for us um, to on demand is too complex or we probably think that it's incredibly expensive. Uh, so for example, um, Amanda mentioned that convincing brands and manufacturers was the hardest part, uh, but we proved that on demand works at scale. Um, at the same time, it is very important to find that right balance in the price. And uh, um, Kevin mentioned that brands will actually uh, change at scale once that right price mm, is found. And uh, that that, uh, that would be the price that brands will be willing to pay um, for that change. And um, another final interesting fact here is that uh, the industry was built around the human. So automation um, would probably not work, for example, similarly as um, 
uh, constructing car on on demand. It has to keep the um, human element in the automation process. And that is yet again, an intricacy of the fashion industry that um, makes it so different and special from um, so many other industries. And this is why we love it so much. Um, one last point here in the attitude is that um, even though we heard oftentimes that customers would pay more or um, wait less, as uh, we mentioned in the use cases. Uh, we also heard that um, to truly scale on demand, it is very important to play by the current rules in the industry. Customers don't at scale compromise. Mm, and as um, rightfully mentioned by Kevin, um, for on demand to scale, the product has to be the fastest, the best, the cheapest, and the most capitalist profitable possible um, so, uh, so that um, <clears throat> um, the on-demand could uh, truly scale and uh, the sustainability layer um, could be introduced into uh, the industry at scale. Um, another interesting area, uh, another interesting thought is that uh, customers uh, don't actually want to co-design and it is very important to find the balance and the customization that would be um, easy and not overwhelming uh, for the customer. These are the three signals within the attitudes that we thought um, are uh, um, important to share um, for brands, um, companies who are considering exploring on demand and their operating and business models. Um, Two other areas um, we'd like to share is that, um, uh, interestingly, uh, the manufacturing aspect uh, in the on-demand oftentimes is that um, is that bottleneck. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, uh, we heard that in driving that change, um, in driving the on-demand um, operations, it is uh, important to break through the manufacturing side first. And a lot of factories are still rely on Excels and emails. And um, some of the tech providers found that it's um, it's it's a mess. And um, oftentimes that is something that stops or blocks uh, the brands to um, to fully embark on the journey. Uh, like this particular change, especially tier two, tier three, oftentimes is this big unknown and uh, um, is not fully digitized. Mm, and uh, um, the next one is that um, key to the change is obviously this workflow digitization uh, for the manufacturers. And um, <clears throat> um, I would uh, uh, like to highlight here that um, manufacturers actually have to be even more technologically ready than the brands. Um, finally, the future outlook is um, Software infrastructure and workflow automation are, uh, they remain the, the major areas uh, for the tech providers, the brands and the factories to crack. Um, <clears throat> it will be a slow change, but once cracked, it will be a total reversal um, of the polls all at once. And finally, um, we are positive in our thought and conclusion that on demand is absolutely working. There has been um, hundreds um, of use cases that um, it um, it is a viable solution and alternative uh, to include into the um, kind of plethora of the business model. Um, and it would slowly become that solid niche. Um, I'm going to basically tell everybody that, you know, it would be really wonderful for them to actually take a look at the Fashion Reset Report because actually there's there's a lot here that's that that really should be unpacked. Um, I, I, I'm going to say that, you know, actually most things were at one point on demand manufacturing, as Rahul actually had said. And in, in, in a certain way, actually, um, if we take this whole model actually fast fashion is not dissimilar to your on-demand model. And, and that's one of the things that actually, it's, it, it, it's, quite, it's quite ironic, isn't it? I mean, the old, um, the original Zara model, and actually most of the, actually the most of the way of, of, of fast turn manufacturing was this model because you actually had all of those things that you needed. You would see where the suppliers and then, that the demand was because of what was actually selling really well. And then you could supply into it very quickly. And so if we take this, um, if we turn that idea on its head on the on-demand model, 
and we say, learn from the things that fast fashion actually was doing that has currently been, is currently being um, vilified for, but we learn from the, the management principles that actually that created that. That's essentially what you're talking about on on-demand manufacturing, right? Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I also, you know, about in 2016, I think, you know, um, Alvanon actually had an incubation program. And one of the companies that we actually looked at was an on-demand manufacturing model. And basically it was a super sample house in, in Shenzhen uh, with you know, some very identified uh, prints and um, colorways. And, and basically you could create some on-demand. Uh, they, they, they were kind of like, it's not really on-demand. It's kind of like, um, it's made, it's not made to measure but it's kind of made to order. And it was a really interesting um, kind of, uh, it was a really interesting experiment that this one company had done. Um, they clothed quite a lot of people and wore very beautiful fabrics. And, you know, it was a, it was a really interesting experiment. Um, and they actually made quite, uh, quite, quite a fair bit. Um, but of course, you know, when, when you actually try and scale that, that's the big issue, right? To scale it for an American um, major market where we're used to seeing a 20% inventory, you know, just sat there just waiting for somebody to come and buy. But I think we all agree that there's a su significant amount of overproduction for the past um, more than 15 years, there's been a significant overproduction. I mean, there was overproduction then, but we have doubled and a half since 2000, since the last financial crisis. And, you know, it's one of the things that, that what you're doing, what you're actually illuminating with your report is wonderful um, that, um, that brands should really take note of. And so with that, I'm going to let you go and we're in the home stretch. Yay. Mm -hmm. I get to go home soon. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here.